Hey, and welcome to part two of the ground instruction for exercise 12 in the flight training manual. We're going to be looking at power on stalls, power on recovery, and stalls with flaps. Keep in mind that there will be a lot of information here that builds on the previous ground instructions, so if you're not up to speed on those, I highly recommend you go ahead and catch up on those before you review this section. So some essential background knowledge you'll need before you continue with this lesson is you'll need to know what is a stall, what are the three main indicators we talked about um, that show you that you have stalled, how do you recover from a stall without power, what are the steps of that recovery, and why is pitch the most important part of stall recovery. So the power on stall carries more energy into the entry, so you'll find the stall to be more aggressive than a power off stall. The most common power on stall is a departure stall when the aircraft is at full power and a nose up attitude. Take the following example from an actual aviation incident. On a short grass strip with high pine trees at the departure end of the runway, a Cessna 150 takes off and enters a steep climbing right hand turn, then rolls to the left and descends in a steep nose down attitude until it collides with the ground to fail. So it's a pretty gr grim example of how a departure stall can quickly become deadly. Training for power on stalls at altitude allows pilots to recognize the symbols of an onset to a stall and hopefully instinctively take preventative action. So let's take a look at what we will review in this lesson on power on stalls. You'll need to demonstrate a power on stall for your flight test and the PPL flight test guide specifically outlines that a candidate must first establish the configuration and power setting as specified by the examiner and then transition smoothly to a pitch attitude that will induce a stall. So again, before you do any upper air work maneuver, you'll always do first your safety check. So we do the hazel check and then you also pick out your geographical fix, which will give you your reference point. So now that the safety stuff is done, we're gonna go into the power on stall and it looks like this. First, you're gonna pull car heat out and reduce power. Next, allow the airspeed to bleed off. Don't lose any altitude and just go towards a slow flight condition. Then add about 2000 RPM of power, control for yaw. And once you have that power input, raise the nose to induce a stall. As I mentioned before, this type of stall will likely be more aggressive than the previous power off stall. It's critically important that you do not allow a wing drop in this kind of stall. If the nose starts to wander or fall to one side, just pick it up with the rudder. For recovery, you'll need to first recognize and announce the stall, then break the stall by pitching down to just below the cruise attitude and applying full power. Control for the additional yaw from the added power and once a safe airspeed has been reached, raise the nose to a climb attitude to regain any lost altitude. Remember that on your flight test, you'll need to return to your original heading, altitude, and airspeed that you were at prior to entering the maneuver. So power on stalls can be grouped into three types of categories. Accelerated stalls are ones which occur at a higher airspeed due to a sudden change in the angle of attack, such as a sudden pitch up from a very nose down descent departure and overshoot stalls, which occur at a relatively low airspeed and result from excessive nose up attitude, attempting to use pitch to gain altitude. And the last one is the turning stall, which results from too much pitch in an attempt to tighten the turn. Due to potential st stress on the airframe, we don't usually demonstrate uh, accelerated stalls. And we just looked at what a departure stall might look like. So now let's take a look at what an overshoot stall might look like. So to demonstrate a full flap overshoot stall, we're going to need to bring the flaps in before we enter this maneuver. So the question comes in, when do we bring flaps in and when do we retract them on the recovery? So let's look at an overshoot process from the pilot operating handbook or the POH. So if you take your POH and you go ahead and look up the procedure for a bulk landing or an overshoot, it shows that flaps should be brought up after the full power is applied. And this makes sense as the flaps retract, the nose tends to want to pitch down and the plane may lose altitude as a result. If the pilot pitches up to counteract this effect, they bring the aircraft closer to an overshoot stall. Also note that the stall speed with flaps is lower than the stall speed without. So if you bring your flaps up before you add additional airspeed or power, the aircraft is likely going slower and is more likely to enter a stall. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here as the process for entering a power on stall with flap is pretty much the same process as entering a power on stall. The key difference here is, of course, bringing in the flap and you want to bring the flaps in before you add the power. And you also want to bring the flaps in 
after you've come into the white arc, so after your reduction in airspeed. Stall recognition is the same, and so is the recovery, a part of bringing up the flaps. So just memorize the process because it must be done this way. First, you recognize the stall, break the stall first by pitching down with the nose to just below level cruise, add full power, and then bring the flaps up in stages once a safe airspeed has been achieved. Lastly, recover as usual back to your original heading, altitude, and airspeed. So the last thing I want to talk about is climbing and descending turning stalls. Remember that the angle of attack is the angle at which the cord line of the wing meets the oncoming relative airflow. In a level climb, the angle of attack of both wings is the same. However, in a turn, this is no longer true as each wing now meets the oncoming airflow at a different angle of attack. In a climbing stall, it is the outside wing that is meeting the relative airflow at a higher angle of attack. And therefore in a climbing turn, it's the outer wing that is the most likely to stall first. In a descending turn, because the relative airflow is meeting the inside wing at a greater angle of attack than the outer wing, it is the inside wing that will stall first. One of the ways to think about this is to think of a spiral staircase. The inner track of the staircase is much more vertical than the outer track. Some common errors in the power on stall exercise are really just maintaining directional control, preventing yaw and preventing wing drops. You really wanna think about aileron control versus rudder control at really high angles of attack. Your rudder is definitely gonna have more authority than your ailerons. So if you start to get um, lack of directional control, think about controlling it more with your rudder as opposed to with your ailerons. You also wanna avoid a secondary stall. A secondary stall can occur if you go into your recovery two nose down and then pitch up too quickly to try to regain that altitude. That can actually put you back into another stall. It's called a secondary stall, and that's a common error when practicing power on stall recovery. Okay, here are some review questions for you. So go through them, see if you can answer all of them, but most importantly, just make sure that you know the steps for the entry recognition and recovery for all types of power on stalls. It's way cheaper to learn them here on the ground, and it's going to make your in-flight training all the more effective. Cool. Thanks for making it through this slide, and uh, have a great day.